Hello everyone! Welcome to the second part of Einstein's field equations in vacuum. In the last video, we showed that the geodesic equation, coupled with the vanishing of the Ricci tensor, was equivalent to Newton's equations of gravitation, provided the gravitational field is weak and the velocities are much smaller than the speed of light. We tentatively concluded that Rij equals to zero is the correct theory of gravitation in vacuum. In this video, we solve this equation exactly for a spherically symmetric stationary object, such as a star or a planet. We begin by imagining an infinitely rigid scaffolding, which we construct around some point in space. If a spherical mass was to suddenly appear at this point, the scaffolding, being infinitely rigid, would keep its current shape. We can therefore use the scaffolding as the basis of polar coordinates r, theta, and in three dimensions also phi. Using an infinitely rigid meter stick, the distances along and perpendicular to the radius r would not be affected by the presence of the mass. However, the same cannot be said of time. A clock placed at this distance from the planet's center will tick at a different rate than a clock placed at this distance. And if we were to remove the mass, the two clocks would tick at the same rate with respect to each other, but a different rate than either of the clocks from the earlier scenario. To avoid this mess, it is best to take our clock to a distance where the gravitational field due to the mass is negligible. Notice that the four coordinates are now identical to the flat spacetime coordinates in the sense that they are the same whether or not the mass is absent or present. Okay, now that we understand our coordinate system, we want to calculate the spacetime distance ds in terms of it. For an observer moving along any geodesic, this relation is very simple. Tau is simply time elapsed for this observer. So our goal is to relate our flat spacetime coordinates to the time elapsed on a clock moving along an arbitrary geodesic. First, let's use the spherical symmetry to eliminate a few elements of the metric tensor. Recall that in special relativity, the only spatial dimension that was distorted was the one along the direction of motion. The other two spatial dimensions were unaffected. Here too we make the assumption that the only spatial dimension affected by the presence of the mass is along the radial direction, while the other two directions, perpendicular to it, are unaffected. So, the component of a spacetime distance on the surface of a sphere, centered at the object's origin, will retain this form, regardless of the object's mass. The square spacetime distance then reduces to this. But we can go one step further. By making this coordinate transformation, and remembering that the metric is time independent, we can write the spacetime distance in terms of the new coordinates like this. But since ds squared is an invariant quantity, it must be equal to ds prime squared, which leads to this identity, which in turn demands that this condition be satisfied. But this is possible only if g0i is zero. So, based on symmetries alone, we conclude that the square spacetime distance must be of this form, where g00 and g11 are functions of r only. To complete the analysis so far, let's also write down the other components of the metric tensor. All we have to do now is to work out the Christoffel symbols and insert them into Einstein's field equations for vacuum. It is a good exercise to work out the Christoffel symbols with just a pen and paper. I will not do this here because it would take too long, and besides, it is as straightforward as taking derivatives. I do encourage the students among you to do this without the aid of a computer. I will wait. Okay. Now that you have done it, let's compare notes. This is what I got. All other components are zero. If we now plug in these into Einstein's field equations for vacuum, we end up with these three equations. All other terms of the Ricci tensor are either zero or equal to one of these three equations. Notice that the system seems to be overrepresented. We have more equations than functions. Unless one of the equations is surreptitiously equivalent to one of the other two. No matter. Let's follow the logic and see what we get. Notice that these two equations are identical, except for these terms. 
If we subtract one from the other, we get this simple identity. Inserting it back into equations 1, 2 and 3, we obtain these. Since 1 and 2 are identical, we only need to focus on 2 and 3. We see that the two terms in equation 2 differ by one derivative, and the higher derivative is multiplied by r. Experience tells us that the solution of A should therefore be a polynomial, where C1 and C2 are, for the moment, arbitrary constants. And indeed, inserting these back into 2, we get an equation for n, the solution of which is minus 1. So, A is this. Solving for b is now a simple matter of algebra. So finally, we obtain a solution for the metric tensor, and hence the square space-time distance. But what about c1 and c2? Well, we can work out c2 from the condition that as r goes to infinity, the metric must converge to the flat space-time metric. This is possible only if c2 is 1. The other constant can be determined from the condition that in the limit of weak fields we must recover Newton's gravitation. In the previous video, we have shown that in the weak field expansion of g00, h00 was equivalent to 2 phi over the speed of light squared, where phi was the Newtonian gravitational potential. Comparing these two expressions, we see that c1 must be this, where g is the Newton's gravitational constant and m the mass of the object. Before I conclude, I would like to correct a small mistake in the previous video. I've made a huge mistake. I think I may have made a big mistake. <laughs> I made a huge tiny mistake. I made a mistake. <laughs> I may have been mistaken. In a computation of the Christoffel symbols, I said that the inverse metric was given by these expressions. This was correct up to the sign here, which should have been minus. This flips the sign in these equations. Consequently, this alters the definition of H00, which changes very little for the previous video, but makes a big difference in this one. C1 being positive would lead to very different and much less interesting physical phenomena than its correct form. So, in conclusion, we have derived the time-independent space-time distance for a spherically symmetric object in vacuum. This result was first obtained by Karl Schwarzschild while fighting in the trenches during World War I. Pretty impressive, huh? Deservedly, this space-time geometry is called Schwarzschild geometry. In another video, we look at a couple of phenomena that result from this geometry. And that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching. Thank you.